Roshan, my, my connection is very bad. I'm sorry, I hardly plugged in. Um, like everywhere. I'm trying, yeah, well, I'm trying to, to move a little bit, maybe in this part of the, wait a second, because I was moving all over the place, trying to figure out where is the best place to, to have it. Let me see this. Ah, maybe I think it, it's better in here. Okay. Okay, do you, do you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Oh, Madene, yes. Obviously, you're the closest one to me because I heard you yes almost through the window. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Boris, I don't hear you. Belgrade is becoming so far from me. No, 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 no. I, I'm first who said uh, ciao Zlatko, but you didn't hear that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was trying to be. <laughs> okay. Zlatko? Okay. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I see so many, many familiar faces in here. I, said, I almost said all familiar faces. And thank you very much. Uh, just like I'm doing that with one of us. Uh, so, uh, do we have Roshan uh, order of speakers, or or shall we? Shall I go my way? I, your way. Okay. So, the theory of some of us already participated in uh, uh, discussions on, uh, on the same topic, but the topic is only the title of the topic is the same. And basically speaking, the topic is like moving target. It is uh, going uh, very quickly in, uh, in very uh, interesting discussions. Uh, in any way, uh, this, today, we, uh, we are planning to talk about the role of, so to speak, outside players in what is going on. But in any case, uh, since we are talking about outside people, I would like to have maybe, if you don't mind, that we start with Paris, to tell us a little bit about overview, brief overview, what is the state of the state in the state of Azerbaijan, including Nagorno-Karabakh as part of the state of Azerbaijan. And then we can uh, proceed with a major let's say players who are coming from another side of the world, which Susan means that you should prepare yourself for the very, very brief introduction. After Fariz, we have Fariz. So Fariz, please, the floor is yours. Uh, do you hear Fariz? I'm the only one who doesn't. Fariz? Fariz, do you, we didn't hear you. You see how you are. Roshan, I hear you, but I don't see yeah, you. Yeah, I think him. What is? I got him. Uh, admit again. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, now yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. It's actually a great pleasure for me to start this conversation. It is a great honor for me, actually, among such distinguished group of uh, public figures and politicians. Uh, I am the youngest participant, but uh, just to say a few words, uh, the war is unfortunately continuing and uh, the escalation is, 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 is huge. Uh, there, there are military activities going on, not only in Karabakh, but also outside of Karabakh, in Ganga and other areas. And as we speak right now, Azerbaijani foreign minister is meeting uh, State Secretary Pompeo to discuss some uh, uh, possibilities for you know, peace process. But what is important that Azerbaijan is uh, putting forward one condition, that is that uh, you know, peace can be signed and ceasefire can be agreed upon only if there is a concrete schedule for withdrawal of Armenian troops. And so far, this schedule is not provided. Therefore, military activities are continuing. It was very interesting yesterday to hear Vladimir Putin to speak. Uh, he has um, you know, said clearly that the war is going on within 
territory of Azerbaijan, that this is, um, you know, the issue of territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, which must be restored. Uh, these are important messages to the international community that Armenia should not wait for Russia to interfere. Um, you know, Russia and Turkey are two potential parties which can get interfered into the conflict and this can get even more escalated. So message from Putin was very important. And I think it is also important to think about the future of Minsk Group, whether Minsk Group will continue in current format or there's a possibility for Turkey to get involved. These are two important messages that I would like to pass to the group. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Faris. I hope that uh, Martin and Boris uh, uh, like the idea that we first hear after we hear, heard Faris uh, telling us, the, let's say, as a person who is close to where the things are going on, that we cross now to uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, colleagues from that part of the world. So, Susan, I would appreciate very much if you, just as uh, our long lasting partner in this, all these discussions that we had recently, that you take the floor, please. Well, thanks, uh, Zlatko, and thanks to all of you. Um, I know some of you have participated in these discussions before, and uh, some of you are new, but to give you maybe just a little bit of background, this is something uh, I think that I've been thinking about a long time. I'm a retired US diplomat. I worked on this issue back in the 1990s when I was at the State Department. And back in February, Ambassador Sukuda and I uh, started I would say talking, brainstorming about, is there some way where, and we were talking about not bringing governments together, but to do track two discussions. We talked with Rav Sean, and that has kind of evolved. The pandemic happened, so we really couldn't meet. But you know, as the conflict has heated up, we have, and I wanna thank NGIC and Zlatko and Boris and others, for bringing uh, this discussion, um, you know, bringing people together for the discussion. And since we last spoke, for those of you who don't know, we spoke, I guess it was last Friday, one week ago, you know, there has been increased rhetoric uh, between the leaders of the countries. Um, I will say, uh, as we just mentioned, uh, I'm very pleased uh, that Secretary Pompeo has called both the Foreign Minister of Armenia and the Foreign Minister of Azerbaijan to come to Washington. I think they're now, they're going to meet there today. I don't think that um, they're all meeting together. I think he's meeting with them separately, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And from uh, the press, I have read that there were some uh, perhaps uh, representatives or one of the co-chairs from the Minsk group was always also in Washington to, uh, to discuss. Um, so to me, that's a good sign that both sides are willing at least to, and I'm very glad because I think last week, one of the things I lamented about was what is the U.S. Uh, doing to help try to bring a ceasefire. And, um, and I'm also very pleased that, you know, as another uh, Minsk Group co-chair that, you know, Russia as trying to be involved in, in calling a ceasefire. But, you know, since we last spoke, I think one of the things that concerns me is the rhetoric has increased between the two sides. And it does appear, again, I'm just from reading and following the situation, you know, that uh, Armenian Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan um, made some public statements about um, that there's no way to have a diplomatic uh, solution. And then, of course, the Azerbaijan side, I think it was uh, Mr. Hajiev. Uh, said kind of the same thing in response. And, um, and then I think Turkey also weighed in about it. So I feel since we spoke last week that there's kind of an, not only is the, you know, the violence and the, the humanitarian toll increasing, but it doesn't seem, you know, that either side is willing to say, let's sit down. Although I was very pleased to hear you say that, um, well, the, the, you know, Azerbaijan is willing to have a ceasefire, but you know, I think the issue, the precondition of giving up territory is also something that has been discussed for many, many years. So um, I also read that, you know, the Armenian foreign minister went to NATO and NATO said, you know, they're not going to get involved in a military, you know, conflict. They think there should be a diplomatic solution. So one of the things that we left with last week is, 
how can we get people to sit at the table and talk to one another? And something that I think um, all my colleagues from uh, former Yugoslavia have said, especially Zlatko, is that you can't, you come to a compromise when all parties want to have a diplomatic solution and sit down and discuss things. So I don't see that right now. But then what I wanted this group to explore last week is, is there another mechanism? If the Minsk group uh, isn't the mechanism, do we have another way? Is it through you know, the UN because the UN had had resolutions? Is there uh, another kind of a coalition of other interested parties who could get both sides you know, to sit down and, and talk about uh, this issue and to stop the, um, the violence? Because I think probably everyone on this call agrees that um, we don't, I personally think that military um, conflicts are not the solution to disagreements and the best way uh, to get peace and stability in the region is to um, is for the sides to sit down and talk about um, some kind of mutually agreeable uh, solution. So I'll leave it at that. I don't have a lot of um, new ideas from last week, but I will say I have talked to a few Armenian Americans, um, and uh, it's uh, it's extremely hard for them to be um, dispassionate about this situation. Um, so, and I've had a lot of interaction also with my friends in uh, Baku and, and Azerbaijan. So um, I hope that today maybe we can again continue to explore some ways that we all could get each side to sit down and stop the, you know, the fighting and try to come up with some new ways to solve the conflict. So uh, I'll leave it at that, Zlatko, and happy to discuss more. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, you joined us, Alex Krishnayev. Sorry for my, yeah. I'm so glad that you joined us. To, after all of us were here, because without you, I would be the last one. So I'm thanking you so much, Alex, because my lungs were not so good, and I am sure that your communication was also, you had some problems with communications. Anyway, so, uh, if if uh, if you don't mind, I would ask uh, uh, David David Merkel uh, to take the floor, so we can hear from uh, you as an expert who were actually uh, in State Department being in charge of this area, which includes us as to a certain extent. But I mean, this is also area that you are uh, very familiar with. So please, David, could you open up? Thank you very much, and and. Uh... Uh, thanks to uh, the Nazmi Ganjavi International Center for, for or, organizing this. And, and uh, obviously, um, my condolences, all of our condolences to the, uh, uh, those who suffered the loss of life in this, in this current uh, fighting. And obviously, a, a peaceful resolution is, is what uh, uh, everyone uh, desires. I started traveling to Armenia and Azerbaijan in the, in the mid 90s and have been to the line of contact uh, on both sides of the, uh, the, the territory and have seen uh, the, the, the military, the refugees and the, the, the lack of, um, of opportunity, uh, talked with a great number of the people who, who fought in the, the war from, from uh, uh, 88 to, to, to 94. Uh, and um, this has been, as you mentioned, uh, a topic of, of great importance um, in, in all of my uh, jobs uh, with uh, uh, the House Republican leadership, Senate Foreign Relations, uh, State Department, and National Security Council. And unfortunately, it, it has not been one that has had sustained high level attention uh, in capitals. And I think that that uh, has to be recognized in part as uh, the, des the desperation which has led to um, the, the military action that's gone on now. Uh, Reagan's uh, Secretary of State, George Shultz, talked about, uh, talked about gardening, uh, that working with um, alliances and allies and dealing with international solutions were not things that you simply parachuted into, 
uh, but they required a lot of a spade work, a lot of a lot of work. And and speaking from the U.S. side, um, we have not uh, provided appropriate leadership on this issue. Russia has been a, a status quo player. It has benefited uh, from uh, the the region uh, not being fully unified and uh, countries able to uh, move on from a frozen conflict uh, into a greater cooperation with, with, their, with their neighbors. Uh, it's sad that we have a, a presidential election um, uh, eight years ago uh, in August. It was a war in, in Georgia. Now uh, in September, there's a war back in the, in the, in the caucuses. Um, I think that uh, the, the situation has been laid out well thus far, but I, I would add certain complications. Uh, Moscow, uh, as I mentioned, is the status quo player, uh, but the Minsk group has lost its credibility. Um, uh, Turkey is now involved in, in ways that is well familiar to those on the call and those in the audience. And one of the Minsk group partners, France, has a very difficult relationship currently uh, with Turkey. Russia is uh, on opposite sides in the civil war in Syria and Libya and competing in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so their cooperation uh, is definitely something of, to be questioned. Uh, but also uh, Turkey's miscalculation about how important the caucuses is uh, to Moscow uh, could also be miscalculated. The idea of a, of a new um, gathering for this I, I don't think that um, we should look to replace the men's group, but I don't think we should look to the preservation of the men's group being um, the, the solution. Uh, sometimes the partners, and again, I'll just speak about the U.S., sometimes the U.S. has placed men's group unity uh, above real concrete movement in uh, a solution. So Turkey's involved. It's going to remain involved. Uh, I don't think we want to see this uh, conflict uh, move in the direction of the Astana negotiations in Syria, uh, where it is Moscow, Iran, and, and Turkey, and the United States uh, and Europe is not involved at all. But I don't think that uh, returning it to uh, the Minsk group as it's operated for the last uh, 20 some odd years is going to be satisfactory to the, uh, the, the partners. Um, the last point in this first round is um, in in Armenia, uh, the, 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 the government. Should I stop here? No, continue, David. Uh, Alex was probably he's now switched off. Continue, David. Sorry. Right. Um, just just the last point. Um, there was a lot of hope when the new government came in in, in Armenia. Uh, and uh, I traveled out to, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the caucuses to, to Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia uh, at the end of last year. And, and obviously, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was, was on my mind and whether uh, this new government, this, this government, this prime minister, who was not a Karabakhi as previous ones uh, were, would be somewhat uh, empowered uh, to try and um, reach a peaceful resolution, uh, which would mean that Armenia could move beyond only uh, working with Russia and the Islamic Republic of Iran and could do more and more with, with Europe and more and more with countries in the Caucasus. Uh, I, I think that uh, right now it, it seems like, uh, while initially uh, there was some positive noise towards that, uh, him. Uh, talking tough uh, later, uh, kind of remove the, the possibility. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased that Secretary Pompeo is meeting separately with the two foreign ministers today, uh, but I think much, much more is needed to be done uh, as far as uh, leadership. Last word, the Economist a couple of weeks ago in covering this issue uh, talked about a, a vacuum of leadership uh, was what uh, contributed to this, and I think that we need to try and figure out a way uh, to reverse that. Uh, thank you, thank you, David. Um, I don't know, is uh, Roshan, is Amy with us? 
Uh, no, she's, I think, uh, unmuted. Oh, no, I, I'm here, guys, and I'm sorry. I've just got another project going on. I told Rovshan I, I didn't plan to make an intervention. I'm, I'm here uh, to listen to what you all have to say. I think one point that I would like to see addressed by any of you experts, if possible, is um, how we can keep this story on news broadcasts because we're fighting, especially in the U.S., the election and some other stories. And um, I spoke to Rofshan last week saying that um, I would love to find ways to sort of paint this story in an emotional way and in a cultural way to perhaps grab people's attention differently to keep them following it beyond just the daily um, clashes, which are so important. Obviously, I'm not trying to dismiss the fact that we have to keep on the diplomatic and military aspects of the story, but I think it would be quite useful to find ways, uh, and I would look for your help, to try to bring this story into people's living rooms in a very uh, emotional way and colorful way. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. Just told me that you would like to have some questions for us. I'm sure, I mean, your question requires really a lot, a lot of words. I mean, how we can put this um, let's say, news. But uh, having said so, I will catch up with it, and I'm sure that most of our participants also take in consideration. I mean, the issue that you really raised rightly and concretely. Before we go to Europe, Alex, uh, let us uh, end with this American American story or West Side story. Uh, Ambassador Chekuta, I mean, Robert, if you could take the floor and before we ask Alex to, to jump in or walk into the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lako. And um, actually, I think uh, probably Amy's question is a good point to jump off from because it is, you know, the good news, frankly, has, uh, today is that Secretary Pompeo is meeting with the two foreign ministers. That's something that I'm frankly pleasantly surprised at, um, given all everything that's going on in Washington. Um, I'm not terribly optimistic. I think the most we'll probably see out of the U.S. side are sort of calls for ceasefire, going back to the dis discussions. But I want to come back to the point that 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 uh, Amy's made because I think that's a, that's a that's a key one. Uh, why this matters to Americans, um, I think, is something that has to come across. Unfortunately, I think you know, the the domestic angles of foreign policy are something which we have sometimes forgotten about at, at uh, tremendous cost. Uh, certainly, as we've seen in the United States. But I think what it matters is this is the point in the world geographically where Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, and extremism all come together. Um, we look at the national security strategy four of the five major threats facing the United States cited by the Trump administration come together here. That's Iran, uh, resurgent uh, uh, Russia, Chinese ambitions, um, terrorism and, and international crime. But then also I think one of the things which Washington is looking at, I think in some ways strangely, is Turkey. Um, one of the things which I've found in discussions here has been a real focus on Turkish involvement and its depiction, frankly, of Turkish involvement being a negative. Um, I think some of that is a boil over from other issues going on between the United States and Turkey. Um, and this is where diplomats have to earn their money, which is sort of trying to sort of decompress some of this, to try to separate some of these issues, some of these issues out. I would argue, frankly, I'll put this out and everybody can correct me, that Turkey's involvement in the recent weeks has actually been helpful in terms of countering Russian involvement. That Russia has in the past talked about sending in peacekeepers to this part of the world, which would reinforce a Russian sphere of influence of what Russia has talked about in terms of a near abroad and its special part of the world, very 19th century. Um, Turkey's involvement has checked that. Um, it has raised the cost a little bit for Russia to do, to, to do some of the things it's talked about. Now, while the Armenians may be very angry about this, and Lord knows the Armenian uh, groups in Washington, um, Susan sort of put out this more delicately than I will right now, have been very loud 
um, in terms of, of raising this, this question of Turkey, seeing this as a threat to Armenia's existence. Armenia, or Turkey's uh, uh, attention to the issue has meant that Russia has not been able to sort of simply move ahead with, with um, peacekeepers into the region if it indeed had wanted to do so. But it was something they talked about back in 2016 and they talked about since. So that's a, um, an interesting thing, maybe uh, unnoticed development. Moving forward, I want to come back to uh, something that David said. Um, capitals are never terribly excited about establishing new groups. Um, there's a sort of reliance on what's been done before. The reality, however, is that the Minsk group has not been able to get the credit, has not been able to maintain you know, the credibility it's needed to be able to move things forward. That's not, that's not the fault of the, of the diplomats themselves. I think in some ways it's the attention of, of, of upstairs, of political backing for those diplomats and their efforts. Turkey is a member of the Minsk group. Belarus is a member of the Minsk group. Germany is a member of the Minsk group. Italy, others. Um, it may be that the Minsk group needs to be revitalized. Maybe keep your chairs, because I, uh, I don't know if Armenia would accept a Turkish co-chair. Um, I'm not sure what Germany or maybe Italy um, might be willing to do. Uh, but to move it back to the forefront of things, and this comes back to Amy's question, governments aren't going to move their things forward unless their publics push them to move things forward. Um, but I think what we're seeing here is, once again, these so-called frozen conflicts or protracted conflicts, whether it's Ukraine or Georgia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, Armenia, are dangerous and they flare up at any time. And they can draw in the United States, they can, in this case, uh, Azerbaijan is moving along the Iranian border, what Iran is going to do, you've got it, you know, more, more Azeris living in Iran than in Azerbaijan. Um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, things that may start falling apart here if we don't pay attention and if we don't take a determined action. Today's a good start, but it's a start in Washington. With that, I'll be quiet. Well, um, thank you, Robert. Uh, before I ask you, Alex, to prepare yourself, I just want to make a few points after we had first group of our panelists. Uh, I just want to pay attention or turn attention to some of my friends who are coming, Alex and Boris and Mladen. Uh, we have uh, this issue of Minsk group, as uh, Robert and, and David were mentioning about, is a very important thing but some things have changed in time because uh, of course just as uh, robert said in italy and germany are also there but the point is that italy and germany were important to the men's group as much as turkey the three players initially were named to be usa uh, russia and france uh, today we definitely see that turkey is without being co-chair of the men's group more importantly maybe some of the co-chairs of the men's group so Turkey is getting into, that's one aspect, I think, which is very important. Another one is that, as you mentioned, I the players are walking into the picture uh, from American perspective that are very of great interest, as well as the European perspective, which is uh, Russia, China, Iran, and Turkey being very moving into the picture collectively almost. I think that what happened in Syria should be a good lesson to everyone. Uh, because four or five years ago, you know, I'm not saying earlier, uh, we had the players who today keep in Syria who were not the players at all. I mean, especially not being treated so seriously. But now uh, I think that USA and European Union have learned some lessons from Syria in case how European Union and the United States are no more so important partner. Or some other countries in Syria who are from Iran, uh, Russia, and, and Turkey, not mentioning further, which were not in the picture so much before. This, uh, yeah, yeah, last night I saw in the press a uh, very interesting uh, intervention by President Putin. He was uh, participating in called Baldai, or uh, International Debate Club in Moscow. And he made very interesting point. He used that as a platform to send some messages. And uh, I think Russia is playing very intelligently, strategically speaking, uh, position in which they are friends to both sides. 
And he literally said, I mean, we have you, uh, Azerbaijani and Azeri who are our friends. And we have 2 million Azer Azerbaijanis in Russia, sending billions of dollars help to there. I'm just talking about this, I'm not commenting anything. But we have also 2 million uh, Armenians who are in Russia. Uh, it's one thing, it is, and for all, both of those countries are our friends and very important to us. So he's playing some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, equal brother to both of them. He literally said that uh, uh, Armenia has two million Armenians in Russia and Christianity is something that is connecting them together. At the same time, he said our brothers are Azerbaijanis because we have 15 million, 15 percent of Russian citizens who are Muslims. And in that context, uh, Azerbaijan is our country as well. So, I mean, we have a situation in which we have one of the uh, big powers playing, obviously. And I think that Pempel being today in region, paying attention to this, is very important for us. As uh, Danny said, uh, it's hard to have anyone's attention. Don't forgive me for ignorance, maybe. But uh, this morning, I woke up at 3 o'clock to watch something that is not happening in my country. Three o'clock in the morning, I was watching debate in, uh, in the United States. So everyone is watching actually what is happening in the United States. So it's very hard to get anyone's attention to anything else in the next 15 days. But we have to prepare for the post 15 days time. In that context, I think it would be good. And I expect my dear friends and uh, Alex and Madan and, uh, and, and uh, Boris to go back to the square one, how we can uh, get, what we can do in order to have more attention on this and to be someone who is pushing the people or in direction of creating the atmosphere that has to be, in the end, we have to have the players on the table, main players, but not only one side players. When I'm talking one side, I'm talking about international. So it doesn't be Russian people with Russian salad uh, on, a, on a plate only. So let's see how we can have something more than that. So Alex, I'm sure that you definitely are the one who can uh, uh, tell us, so to speak, all those big players and Minsk group ac activists, how we can have them as a part of the solution, not part of the big power game where proxies on the end will uh, be fighting like in Syria. Well, thank you, Zlatko. Hello, everybody. Well, the question is extremely difficult, and uh, frankly speaking, I'm. Uh, that is not enough to say that I'm not optimistic. I'm, I'm quite pessimistic, and I tell you why. Because uh, I remember this um, uh, attempts to find a solution for the conflict in end of 90s and beginning of new century, because Warsaw, Poland, was a place of the meetings, sometimes uh, discreet, very discreet meetings, sometimes uh, much more official meetings between Armenia and Azerbaijan, ministers of uh, foreign affairs of these uh, two countries. And uh, I met them those time, we had uh, good conversation, but I understood the problem historically, politically, ethnically is, is, is dramatically uh, complicated. And that is not so easy to find uh, the solution. And of course, we are 20 years after and still the problem is extremely uh, complicated, first. The second, I think uh, we have, uh, in my opinion, two groups of players. The first are uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And unfortunately, because of the history, because of all this situation, these two countries still are not able to find some compromise, some solution. Uh, despite many years of negotiations, discussions, etc. That is one side, one group of players. The second group of players are the big players, because really that is a conflict in the region where we have a very, very concrete interest of Russia, of Turkey, of Iran, uh, not so much of the United States and Europe, but, but that is enough um, complicity to understand that uh, this conflict is, is um, not only the the problem for these two countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, but that is much more international conflict. The third point, which is a source of my pessimism, is that I observed the politic of um, Russia in the last 30 years, and I understood that for Russians, uh, so-called frozen conflicts are not uh, unacceptable. 
they can uh, find a lot of, um, uh, let's say, uh, sense in this uh, frozen conflicts, uh, because that is not only Nagorno-Karabakh, that is uh, Transnistria, Moldova, that is um, Georgia after the war, Ossetia, etc., uh, 2008, that is now Donetsk and Lugansk, Ukraine. So Russia and Russian um, leadership is quite good to manage such uh, places and to manage such conflicts. But it's also not good because, frankly speaking, if you want to look for some positive solutions, the role of Russia is absolutely crucial. And without Russia, we cannot um, find uh, some, some uh, positive solutions. So uh, I think, uh, of course, Europe is, is very passive uh, because of many reasons. Europe is very much... Uh, involved in own problems. Uh, uh, we have a new problems, Belarus, uh, we have uh, Belarus, we have um, uh, still the, the problem inside uh, European Union. And I don't expect that uh, position of European Union can be stronger as such very nice appeal uh, for ceasefire, for non-violence, and to look for some kind of dialogue. But we had more or less the same position of, of the West uh, 20 or 30 years ago, so this is nothing, nothing new. Uh, of course, it would be good to revitalize, and I, I agree with my uh, colleagues, uh, to revitalize Minsk Group, but I'm very much afraid that Minsk Group, like other Minsk Group, for example, concerning Ukraine, they are not uh, the group to find the solution. That is a group to create some um, uh, mood that uh, we are doing something. That is much more not solution, that is so much more instead the solution to, 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 to create some atmosphere that we try to do, to do something. So that is the next reason of, 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 um, of, of my uh, patient. Then the next point, of course, if what I said before, Russia is the one of the main or crucial players in this situation, unfortunately today, both speak players on the Western side, United States and, 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 and Europe, we have very bad relations with, with Putin's uh, team, with Putin personally and with Putin. So we have a problem how to find uh, now the, the, the possibility to, let's say, meet Putin and to discuss with Putin what we can do together in, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, what we can find uh, the solution. The same we have with the United States. Uh, and of course, uh, Putin has own interest and I, I, I'm very glad what Zlatko mentioned or quoted that uh, Putin said that uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan both they are best friends, good brothers, etc, etc. Uh, maybe that is a chance, that is a chance still that working together with Russia and looking for some um, uh, older and, and deeper dialogue with Russia, we, we we can make the first step at least, but, but I'm not so sure that I think everything what Putin said in Valdai is much more uh, some position, you know, to, to mitigate both sides, but not to, to, to find a solution. Because if, this is my prediction, if, if I can understand Putin today, for him, this frozen conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh is, is absolutely acceptable for next next many years. So generally speaking, I, I, I don't see good, good um, uh, moves uh, now. I think what the European Union can do, or what Europe can do, is to ask for, for ceasefire, for nonviolence, and to, to start the dialogue again. Of course, if Minsk is only chance, is only uh, platform to uh, organize this dialogue, is okay, but in my opinion, this is not a very uh, promising platform, but, but okay. I can, I can accept, um, uh, if I would be the leader of, 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 of Poland again, so I would accept this, this platform, because we have nothing better, uh, and, and uh, try to, uh, to, 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 to go forward. But uh, still, uh, the, the, the timing uh, for, for a solution is, is very bad. America is uh, waiting for the election, is waiting probably for a new president. Europe is very much engaged in their own uh, problems. Russia is isolated from both sides. Uh, Turkey makes own politics, so it's difficult to, 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 uh, to, to contact all these uh, partners, all these players um, uh, to some uh, positive solution. And the last point. Of course, would be good, would be very good to keep this uh, emotional approach to Nagorno-Karabakh um, situation. But again, I think this is extremely 
complicated because first of all, the topic number one in the world today, and unfortunately for the next month, is COVID-19. And during COVID-19 to discuss about uh, other problems is, uh, is okay, but I think it's sometimes it's even counterproductive. It's, it's not, not, not very effective because the people are much more concentrated on this COVID-19 situation. The second, what I mentioned before, we have election in the United States, we have problems in Europe. So I think um, it is, is necessary to organize a lot of um, uh, such groups like um, uh, Gandavi Center, like our discussion, the people of goodwill, to discuss about Nagorno-Karabakh, to keep this emotional approach. Because if uh, the problem will have not such positive, such good advocates, it will die. It will die in the public, in public opinion. In, it will die in, in the media, because uh, we have many problems, difficult problems, and generally speaking, um, the, the people today are much more depressed, as ready to to to, to fight for some, especially for such currently speaking, unknown place like, like Nagorno-Karabakh. So, sorry for, for, for my pessimism, but uh, you know what is the difference between optimists and pessimists? The pessimist is very well-informed optimist. So I, I'm in this group of well-informed optimists and therefore I'm, I'm, I'm not so, so, so optimistic. Sorry, but, but that's it. <laughs> okay, Alex, as always, I mean, you were so realistic that you have to be a pessimist, right? Okay. Uh, if we no, would, some, if we would, Zlatko, sometimes I, I, I was very optimistic. And I tried to be optimistic because to make politics without optimism, this is that is terrible. But if we want to see the situation realist, realistically, so we have what we have. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, my favorite example is Doomsday Clock, which I take a, take a look at it for very many times. In different occasions, doomsday clock that was set up back in '47 that is saying how far we are from midnight and have doomsday clock, uh, doomsday day as a planet. And that doomsday day was back in Korean War, set up two minutes to midnight, and it came back again two minutes to midnight just less than two years ago, January, even before COVID, it came 100 seconds to midnight. So if I look at the doomsday clock, I don't know why I'm talking about today's problems in my own country because doomsday is there. So uh, realistically speaking, we are approaching to doomsday day. But before that happens, it would be good to see what we can do. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, I think it is very important that what we see what we can do as NGIC, I mean, some kind of platform together with our friends with the NCFP and other friendly organizations, what we can do in order to create awareness and to see, uh, to discuss about it and see how we can, let's say, put some kind of little sand, piece of sand or pressure to the to the to the all of us to be more optimistic for reason uh, and uh, to because we were all now as i told you i mean we have two things which are for, for me very disturbing one thing is vacuum that is maybe created the next maybe month or so around american elections which no one will care about anything else but what's happening in the united states elections a lot of players all over the world may use this period to do some things that are not so, let's say, productive. At the same time, we have there's more than evident that Russians, pressure, Russia's leverage in that region is becoming too big for my taste, which may be, maybe my taste is not important one, but I mean, it's too big for, for taste of the people who are looking for a better organized world. And final point is, I mean, what we can do in order to create atmosphere in which the things have to go back to support and acceptance of international law, this very tricky situation because international law is something that is very important in this, this overall atmosphere. Having in mind that I said one of our last discussions that and I'm sure that Madden and Boris will have much more to say about it in this context. You see, in this part of the world where we are, as far as you are looking for the solution in, the, in getting, gaining more territory, you have no solution. What we are talking about is the content of the territory. And we have to, if we want to put people together somehow on the table, we have to say that we should not speak about so sovereignty and territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, 
part of international law because if we get out of that and we put the people on the table that that is questionable then probably no one will be on the table in the near future so in that having that uh, transition in between alex pessimism and mine uh, whatever i would ask mladen uh, or i mean would you take the floor i mean because you are closer to russia Maybe Mladen is closer to Russia because he's in the same city in Banyaluka where Dodik and Dodik is the closest to Russia in this part of the world. But maybe you, Boris, could open this uh, <laughs> debate. And uh, this, uh, this okay. real debate. Okay, thank you, Zlatko. I, I, I'm, I'm sharing a kind of skepticism with, uh, with, uh, with Alexander. I'm not pessimist, I'm skeptical in terms of. Uh, the fast solution on conflict in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, but I would like to uh, make focus on the uh, on the participants in that conflict, not only not only uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, but also uh, the role of Turkey and Russia. I, if I heard. We, we, we have a kind of problem with the uh, with the transfer of voice or not. Now, okay. do you hear me? Yes, uh, we do. Okay. Uh, uh, everyone was mentioning the, the 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 big powers and the middle powers that are involved in that conflict. Uh, United States, Russia, and also countries like Turkey, uh, uh, Iran, like uh, China, in some perspective, because of uh, one belt, one road uh, initiative, passing that territory. Uh, but uh, we have uh, two main uh, rivals in that uh, in, in that area, uh, beside of two countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan. Those countries are Turkey and Russia. And uh, this is very important to mention. Turkey is a, is a very open world in, in the conflict. Russia is a taking very neutral position right now, if I can, if I can define it as a neutral position. But uh, verbally, this is neutral position. Now, we have a best relationship with the countries. Uh, as Alexander has said, uh, they are brothers and something like that. This is uh, uh, in rhetorics, but. We will see what is going to be a real position of Russia if the uh, conflict is going to be continued. Uh, second, uh, if I have to say the, the, the reason why the United States is involved right now in, a, in facilitate, facilitating conflict is not very good. This is because of the uh, election campaign. Joe Biden was a triggering reaction of uh, Donald Trump, and uh, Pompeo was. Uh, uh, asking both sides to come as soon as possible in in the United States, and I think that internal political reason is the best possible motive and motivation for big power to be involved in such conflict, which is extremely serious and extremely dangerous. It is a long-term frozen conflict, and nowadays the crystal clear that frozen conflicts are very dangerous because uh, that conflict can be open. Uh, very short notice in a very brutal way, and we have a very brutal conflict right now. Uh, this is the area of the long term uh, the interest of uh, power. This is area with very sensitive South Caucasus. This is the uh, and Black Sea area, uh, area of the energy, full of energy resources, uh, pipelines, and uh, all other. Uh, uh, Facilities that are very important for functioning all countries in the region. This is why I have a problem. Why Europe? To understand why European Union is taking very new position right now. Uh, someone has said that means group is a, is a, is a solution, which is true. But I have to say that the Security Council of United Nations was a mentioning this group as a partner in, in the process and the facilitator in that process. If this group is going to lose credibility, maybe that is going to uh, create the minimum role of the United Nations. 
in the future. Uh, and this is concerning me very much because microdition has to be key element of cultural institutions that is going to be involved in solving that thing. I fully agree with Alexander who said that without Russia this country cannot exist because Russia has a huge interest in historical relations with both parties, both countries, uh, and also they have a military base in Armenia. Russia is a, is a member of the TO uh, uh, organization of security organization like Armenia. But uh, even Armenia and Russia are not representing the Nagorno Karabakh as independent state. Uh, as, a, as a part of uh, uh, Armenia, and this is why uh, I have to say, uh, in that respect, uh, all of them are fully respecting international law and the issue of territorial integrity. Russia was opening that issue, territorial integrity, but I have to mention that the former president of Serbia, Tif Pandora's book, is open uh, with a decision about Kosovo and the decision of International Court of Justice, who somehow um, Underline that uh, uh, declaration of independence made by uh, assembly of Kosovo didn't violate uh, international law. Uh, I'm not saying that every case is the same, uh, in fact, but all those cases are very similar and they're connected to each other somehow. And this is why I think that we have to, first of all, uh, respect the, uh, the term of principle international law and to respect territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. Uh, second, uh, I think that this group of people, or the uh, Center and other think tanks in the world, has to be involved in, in uh, encouraging uh, other uh, partners and uh, an organization to be involved in, 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 in terms of facilitating but we have to understand that our role is very limited and uh, to understand finally without participation of Russia and kind of agreement between Russia and Turkey, better understanding this conflict will not be really close. I'm afraid, I'm afraid and in that respect really pessimistic because of this conflict, this, the, the, the aid is uh, looking not very, very, very uh, I mean, promising in terms of finding a solution because this very brutal conflict in the past we had many such explanations in a very short term uh, for a few days, but this is not looking um, that uh, uh, promising in terms of solving the conflict very soon. I, I have a real concern that if we are going to have a continuation of the conflict, prolonging of the conflict will be an extremely difficult situation regarding interest not only Azerbaijan in Armenia, but also Turkey and the wider perspective of the power. In that respect, I'm sharing really, really uh, serious concern about further development. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, I see you. Okay, your finger there on the screen means that you are unmuting yourself. Okay, yes. please Correct. continue where Boris stands and please uh, do exactly what I think because we usually think the same about things, but it's such a complex thing like this one, where we have to support uh, our friends in Azerbaijan and international law, but at the same time see how we can be more productive and come bring people to together based on the values in international law and values that we share. So, other than that, thank you for taking the opportunity. Thank you, Zlatko, and thank you to Nizami Gajavi International Center. It's always a pleasure to see so well-known, famous faces. Uh, unfortunately, I, I believe that the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh is slowly entering in a phase where uh, conflict will be seen like a routine issue. At the beginning, it was a big uh, interest of the media. In last weeks, basically, there is no big news from the region, in spite of the fact that uh, we still have a conflict and the fight is continuing. Uh, that means that slowly, a war is becoming a routine daily issue. 
and that it will not appear in the media as long as there are no hundreds, if not thousands, victims, which is not good for the situation on the ground. Realistically speaking, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh is not now the news, which is a very bad and very dangerous situation. And I hope that this will not continue, because if it continues that way, it can continue for a year. For a year, which was basically the case also in Bosnia, where after the first, at the beginning of the war, it was a big news after that. It was just a daily routine uh, story. And I hope that this situation in Nagorno-Karabakh will not, will not continue. What we can do, we can bring attention of the media, of the people, of the big players, as much as we can. I, I really believe it's good to have the meetings like these, uh, letters, uh, warnings to the leaders, and to simply not to accept a situation in which the war is not a big story. It's not in the headlines anymore. And as I said, that that can continue for years. And uh, the biggest the victim of all of that would be uh, the citizens will suffer. Citizens both in Azerbaijan, in Nagorno-Karabakh, everywhere. Uh, what can we expect in the weeks to come? Unfortunately, nothing special. Why? There was a player who tried to organize some sort of the meeting and solution, which is Russia. Basically, it failed. Some people believe that it failed because it, at the beginning it was intention to fail. And that Russia wants basically a frozen conflict like a solution for, if not forever, then at least for a few years or decades to come. There is another option because there is another significant player in the region, which is Turkey. So another option is Turkey and Russia together. Is it realistic? I, I think if they are together, they can at least, if not completely so, they can have the basic pillars of the solution together. But unfortunately, I believe that they are not together. And they don't share the same uh, opinion about the real situation on the ground. To expect in the COVID uh, world that European Union will play a very significant and a very energetic role, it's completely unrealistic. I really believe so. First of all, it's too far from the Europe, and second, Europe expects more from Russia and uh, Turkey even. They may be not happy with the Turkey involvement in the conflict, but they, they can expect, realistically speaking, more from them than to expect that uh, Europe will show them. It's encouraging to hear that uh, Mr. Pompeo will meet both ministers today. But I'm not so sure that the uh, uh, United States have a clear vision how to solve the situation in the region there. It's a far, and as I know, it, my understanding at least is that the United States are not very much interested in the region as a whole. But there are some others, some other issues which are very significant and still without a clear position, the Georgia, for instance, position of, of Georgia in, in, in the whole region. So somehow it looks that the United States are not very much involved. And if we take all this into account, then the pessimistic approach is a very realistic approach. It looks that nothing big will happen and that basically it doesn't look that in short term there is some sort of the, of the solution. And because of that, we have to make a pressure. We have to organize the meetings like that. It can maybe not so significant, but pressure by pressure, everyday pressure will maybe change the, 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 the position of the big players. This, uh, this conflict can be solved only with the big players. I agree with those who said that at this stage, local players are not simply ready to make a compromise. They don't have a political space within their own countries, they need some sort of the excuse from, from the side in order to accept something which will be seen 
like uh, international pressure. And without that, I'm very pessimistic about the possibility in short term to solve this situation. So we need to make pressure on the big players. Big players are significant. I agree with Dodik, with, uh, sorry, with Boris. Uh, <laughs> when, when, when Boris said uh, that international law is important. And I also believe that I will not mention any, any, any specific cases, but too many specific cases around the world of the same, uh, of the same problem, which is basically minority rights versus majority rights, or even more concrete rights of the minorities in some countries versus sovereignty of these countries. If you have different approaches in different parts of the world, that's not the solution. And this was basically the case in the past in a lot of places around the world. You have to stick to the same rules. You cannot compromise with the rules. If the rules is accepted, it has to be applied everywhere. And because of that, I think that the, the role of international uh, law order is extremely important. We have to emphasize that. We have to stick to the same principles. And that will be the very significant message to the local players that they cannot succeed if they are out of the of the basic of the basic pillars of international international law. Well, thank you, Mane. Before we, uh, I hope that we will in uh, in let's say next round of uh, uh, discussion will come to some kind of uh, maybe. Uh, sharpened uh, ideas about the way to way to go, especially in we obviously we defined few. All of us agree that uh, the role of big players are inevitable. We all agree, basically speaking, that uh, that Russians, Turkish, and potentially Iranian and who knows else whose influence is going to go in direction that. Uh, European Union and United States will be out of the game if the things go in this direction, and especially if it goes in direction that we have status quo, where Russians and Turks, Russia and Turkey are the players who are guaranteeing that the things will go on on the ground rightly, then obviously we are going in direction of pleasing pleasing Moscow. I wouldn't, the Justice Biden said, I wouldn't bet on uh, Russia, Russia, Turkey, long-term cooperation and playing same tune. Maybe this looks yesterday more, but uh, I'm sure that in the future we may see different outcomes. In this context, I think it would be of great uh, interest, as people, I think uh, I would be interested in uh, hearing, uh, listening people who are coming from Euro-Atlantic side of the spectrum. I mean, what we can expect from United States. And David, I would ask you first, if you can take it for what we can expect, I mean, from United States, uh, because obviously this is not only about Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is about much, much bigger, bigger stakes on the table. This is about international, respecting of international law. And this is about the impact and influence of the players who are not, so to speak, players who are so welcomed to be spreading around when we are looking at them here from Western Alliance, uh, Western Euro-Atlantic Euro part of the world. So what we can expect, and can we expect anything uh, new in next year, if not today, where we have new administration or whatever administration, but with new administration, in any case, can we expect something more? Especially, Alex, I mean, what we can expect from European Union? I mean, do we really have to all wait like America, we in Bosnia I used to wait for America as a cavalry to walk into the movie in the last scene and just clean the Indians and help this besieged convoy to, to, to get out of the misery. So who are we waiting? When, when we will have Americans be realizing that this is not about Azerbaijan, this is about all of us? Great, great, dis great discussion. And I'd, I'd love to pick up on that. Um, uh, as, as kind of framed by President Kuznetsky and, and Ambassador Sakata, uh, <coughs> I, I am not that sanguine about uh, Russia, uh, Russia's influence on this. They are the, the status quo player. They benefit from frozen conflicts 
They like instability as their, as their buffer zone. And unfortunately, over 26 years, in the eyes of the, the belligerents, the U.S. and France ha have lost their uh, great degree of their credibility as being active participants of the men's group code shares. Uh, so we can't, we can no longer uh, leave it to Russia. And, and it's, it's not surprising that, that Turkey um, has an interest and has stepped in and has stepped in, in, in a big way. Um, I, I think that uh, the next thing, however, is perhaps what um, Ambassador Sakata suggested as far as uh, not think about the Minsk co-chairs with the full Minsk group. But I, I again, just think that the Minsk group is, has lost its, its usefulness. And perhaps the very next step would be uh, something from the, uh, the UN Secretary General. Um, with regard to what's next in, in America and kind of our colleagues' question about how this, why this would matter to the, uh, the U.S. population, is, is we, are, we are looking, people who, who would, would read um, uh, of the uh, uh, 19, uh, early 1900s uh, would be very comfortable with what they see happening today in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and, and now uh, tension in the Caucasus between, between Turkey and, and, and Russia. Um, uh, Dr. Kissinger uh, you know, was concerned about what looks like the, the, the precursors of, of, of World War uh, I. I. I think that, um, I think that, that, that Vice President Biden Am I the only one who lost, David? No, no, no. Uh, we all lost. We all lost, David. Okay. Um, we do, but, but we are David, 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 I'm sorry. We lost you for two minutes, last minute. So if you can just. I was good. I was good. Oh, you, I, um, I'm sure that uh, your last two minutes were the best. Where, where, where did you lose me? <laughs> We lost you just a minute ago. I'm kidding. Just, just. Kissinger, Kissinger, on Kissinger. You to, yeah, yeah, you were about to say something also about Vice President. I assume it's Vice President Biden. Um, that so, is what so, you were about to say. so, so I, I think that I think that the the, the situation that, that we're in now, there's a lot of reasons for an American audience, for a European audience, to be concerned about uh, conflict, especially conflict as it as it steps closer and closer towards. Uh, Europe and is is um, in a part of the world as as Ambassador Sakata uh, described, where so many of the the interests and and, and the the, uh, the issues collide. Um, in in full disclosure, I'm a member of the, a group called the former Senior National Security uh, Republican uh, National Security Officials for Biden. But I think Vice President Biden will win. I think that he will invest more in our alliances. We'll do more gardening, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Secretary Schultz. Uh, but but there's some tense times right now. But we cannot uh, we cannot leave this for for Russia. And we 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 have to engage uh, either through the UN uh, or directly. Uh, but we can't have it as a purpose just to reconstitute the men's group. We have to work on uh, uh, solving this issue. Well, uh, before I ask uh, Ambassador uh, Chakuta, Robert, to take it for, I would, uh, please, Roshan, uh, I would ask you to, to give us some thoughts, please, on this before uh, we go to the second round. Thank you, Prime Minister. Actually, it was very interesting, like uh, recently, all Russian media and uh, news, uh, uh, TV channels are like discussing uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and uh, and they are like you know clearly they are pro-Armenian, and the last one which I saw uh, I heard it was uh, one of the parliamentarian of Armenia uh, of Russia, uh, Russian Parliament, and he said clearly that we will not allow uh, Turkey to be uh, next to us, and we are not going to allow Turkey to have an influence in Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan is in the field of our influence. 
and then uh, you know these kind of rhetorics are coming and going on that's uh, things that i think you know and also last time as we said that president Weider, uh, president freiberger said you know it's a uh, russia is benefiting from this conflict financially also like you know they are giving for free uh, to armenian military troops and then they are selling for billions troops to azerbaijan that's all yeah well, thank you, Roshan. Uh, before I call Robert here, I just want to make connection between what uh, uh, David was saying about this reviving men's group, but basically speaking, getting out of the men's group as United States involvement a little bit more directly, not only going through the men's group. I don't know why it reminds me of, uh, Susan knows that much better than I do, this Dayton dynamics. We had Ben Soven. Ben Soven was just like some kind of shrinked men's group. We had the quartet at that time, uh, big players, and they were sorting out the issues in here. But then after a while, it came out, I mean, we have uh, the Obruk who walked into the picture and everyone was there, but it was obviously American-led led solution. I think that that has to, we have to think in that context a little bit more. Susan, I, I hope Robert, you won't mind if Susan takes yeah, I would just say I um, I agree with that logical because I think one of the reasons that U.S. was uh, very helpful in helping parties to solve uh, the issues in uh, former Yugoslavia was that we did have a strong person like uh, Richard Holbrook, who then worked with the Secretary of State, who then um, you know consulted. Uh, and I don't see that uh, kind of a person now, but I think that's uh, maybe what I was saying before and looking for some new way, because I would agree um, with David, I don't think the Mintz group, um, I mean, they've had 27 years to try to solve this and they haven't, and it could be because of the interaction with Russia, with Turkey, with others that, you know, they're not perhaps seen as, um, you know, as a, a neutral player but I'd also like to go back to something that um, Amy said is you know how can we get um, this story in the media I mean all I've seen basically at least if you look at whether it's Fox News or CNN it's kind of a ticker on the bottom yeah uh, but it doesn't resonate and unless you're really Armenian American there are very few people who understand the conflict um, one of the most, I think, moving pieces that I've seen since this, uh, the heightened um, you know, military conflict was done by the BBC, and they actually showed the human toll from both sides uh, you know, in kind of uh, a balanced piece uh, on that. The other thing I would say is, and I don't know, again, uh, you know, I'm not the average uh, news consumer in the US because I know this topic I'm interested in it, but um, I noticed that you know the two foreign ministers are going to be in the US. I noticed the Armenian foreign minister, at least I was invited to a discussion where he's going to speak. I don't know if the foreign minister from Azerbaijan is going to do that. I don't know if, um, if uh, Secretary Pompeo is going to, um, to, to be um, you know, having some kind of press availability, but I think that would be helpful. And I think this idea, and I want to say it was Mladen said that, but even Alex, but for US interests, this idea, and even Bob mentioned this, that this is kind of the intersection of the countries that at least in the US, uh, no matter who uh, gets uh, elected, and I will um, say uh, in the interest of um, being transparent, I'm part of the same group that um, that David is part of, um, you know, national security leaders for uh, President Biden. And um, so I'm saying no matter who wins, and even if the President Trump wins, you know, kind of looking at this idea of the US needing to step in because the kinds of threats that I think either Republicans or Democrats see um, in the bigger picture are the threat, you know, this is, could be because it's close to Europe, a threat, you know, to Europe. But the fact that Iran, Turkey, and Russia um, are somehow involved and perhaps making the conflict worse um, is something that maybe would resonate to a certain extent with uh, American people. And I would agree with Rafshan. We discussed this again in our last meeting. But you know, 
how can Russia be kind of uh, a, a neutral player if they're giving or selling arms to both sides of the conflict? Um, so, uh, and Turkey's involved as well. I'm not sure what uh, Iran is doing. So I would like to see, um, you know, someone like a Richard Holbrook emerge uh, from uh, the US. Um, but even if President o uh, Biden wins, or Vice President Biden wins, I think that it's going to be difficult unless we can come up with something, and I'm very glad that, you know, Amy is with us. It's something that could be resonate uh, in the press about how this is really a humanitarian conflict. I will also say that in the US, I think there are probably more, the people who understand this are the Armenian Americans, Armenian lobby. I will say they've done some things. I live in New York. Um, they shut down the Brooklyn Bridge a week ago and complaining about the conflict. It was covered on the local news. I doubt it if it was covered on the national news. But again, it wasn't clear why they were shutting down the Brooklyn Bridge, um, at least in the news reporting. I mean, I knew why they were doing it, but I don't think the average person did. So that would be one thing is to have somehow through the media, um, if you want to get pressure on whomever the next administration is, is to somehow make this resonate, at least in US and, and hopefully in Europe uh, as, as well. Because I do think, and I agree with Alex, that whether it's European Union or um, you know the US, people are so worried now about the COVID and about the economic situation that this has provided, this vacuum to me has provided the opportunity to have this conflict um, uh, heat up uh, because um, the players that normally would have been involved. And I think, uh, as if I think back to 2016, and Bob probably knows this better than I do, you know, when these conflicts have heated up before, I mean, US stepped in right away and tried to bring people together. But I would agree with what everyone said. I think we can't um, let this just not come to the forefront or keep trying to bring it to the forefront. Because if we don't, I think, you know, that Russia will, um, try to dominate the, you know, the outcome. And to me, the best outcome for them seems to be keep the conflict frozen as it is. And just one other little thing, I'm not saying I agree with this, I'm saying this is what I hear, because I've talked to a few Armenian Americans, and for whatever reason, you know, it's almost a black and white situation for them because you, when you try to bring up international law and they have taken Azerbaijan's territory, their uh, point of view is, and I'm not saying I agree with this, I'm just telling you what I hear, is that, well, this was part of Armenia and it's our territory, you know, and we had to take it back. And um, so in their mind, at least in Armenian Americans' mind, uh, now the fight is uh, keeping what they consider to be their territory. And they've kind of, if they even thought it was a violation of international law, the average person that you speak to doesn't see it. So I'm just giving you this overview of um, how, you know, how to kind of bring this to the forefront of the American people and how to um, to do. And I remember even I worked with, and you know, Zlatko mentioned, um, you know, the Dayton Accords, but I worked for Secretary Christopher when they were doing that and he and um, Holbrook. And I do think that the, uh, the, it was in the news more, people were more aware of what was going on in former Yugoslavia at, at the time than I think um, is, is happening now with Azerbaijan and Armenia. So I'll just say that, but I'm very glad, Amy, that you're here because I do think figuring out a way to bring this and you know, get this in the media is an important aspect of, um, you know, of trying to get some kind of a resolution or at least bring the parties to the table. Yeah, I'd love to ask a question, but I see that someone else's hand has been up for a while. Yes, Amy, go on. And I was planning anyway to, to ask you to have a second round. Maybe maybe Fad is just because he's raising hand for so long. And I'm, so, I'm sure that Robert will let you 
will ask you to do before him. So just after we hear Fares a little bit, because then we are talking so much about the Azerbaijan and Russian, and here are the only ones who are sitting in Baku and being there. So maybe it's not some, I would ask Fares if you don't mind naming an ambassador. Just yes, just one, just one minute, just one minute. I would like to say that this can conflict can have, Yes, yeah, please. just just one minute to say that this conflict can have very bad bad consequences for Europe and US in three different ways. One, if the energy infrastructure gets damaged, pipelines and many other facilities get attacked, this will disrupt the energy supply to European markets. And we just completed the new gas pipeline, so it will be a real disaster. Second way, if Russia brings uh, the peacekeeping forces into the Caucasus. This will be a real disaster. I think that it will be a disaster both for Azerbaijan, but also for Euro-Atlantic community. So we are very worried about why Lavrov is keep pushing uh, about these peacekeeping troops. And the third consequence will be, of course, if uh, Azerbaijan and Caucasus get uh, somehow under Russian influence, the way Belarus is now being absorbed by Russian geopolitical interests. And, and we see that if we lose Belarus, then the next target will be Caucasus. So uh, one way to, to prevent all of these is to keep pushing on the previous uh, plan, peace plan, OEC peace plan, uh, about the basic principles, Madrid principles, that the surrounding territories should be liberated at the first stage, and the Karabakh could get some sort of interim status. And then uh, later on, once the refugees go back and communities build more trust, the final status of Karabakh can be decided. I think if we keep pushing on the previous OSCE plan, it might work this time. Thank you. Paris, thank you. I think you were very helpful and I'm so glad, I mean, that you were so enthusiastic about getting the floor or getting the screen in these circumstances. So you really used the more, more minutes like you were talking much more. So thank you so much. I think that Paris was very clear and I'm very glad that uh, you brought, brought that energy issue on the table because this is something which i mean <laughs> it 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 sometimes we either don't see it or we don't want to see it because when you bring in energy issue then it means that it's only about energy but obviously the energy issues is and i think your second point about about uh, russian's peacekeeping forces this is really i mean a uh, scary scenario not for azerbaijan but i think it should be a scary scenario for everyone that is uh, uh, looking in geopolitical sense, seen from different directions than Moscow, especially it would be seen for us who are coming from turbulent and unfinished job for parts of the European Union, like Western Balkan is. So if we would have in Azerbaijan uh, or in part of Azerbaijan, which is Nagorno-Karabakh, we would have uh, Russians as a sole problem solvers for the world problem, then, uh, it would create, I don't, I want to mention uh, Mladen's alter ego, uh, Miller Dodik, because in one moment Mladen said me and Dodik, which is completely wrong. I mean, Dodik is uh, excellent, Lorodik is the best player of Russia in this part of the world. And sometimes he, he's mentioned so much that sometimes we see him everywhere around us. But I mean, that would be a very, very bad example for everyone who wants to play more Russian card than it is decent under these circumstances. Thank you very much. Uh, Amy, you want to put the question now or? Yeah, and I'm going to have to jump off pretty much on time, but um, this may sound very naive, but some of the themes that have come to mind as I've been thinking about this are um, the hatred or the animosity, maybe I should say, between the two sides, which is historic. Is there anyone with any great mediating ideas to get past that? Because it seems to me until that is dealt with, and I'm thinking of tr truth and reconciliation, um, I'm thinking of some smart mediators. I don't know who they are, but is that a theme that could be worked on, brought up in the media uh, particularly to, um, I don't know, even set an example for other in, entrenched conflicts like the Israel-Palestine conflict. I mean, are there lessons that can be shared uh, between warring factions in the United States right now? I mean, are, are there some great, great minds or should there be some great minds now thinking about how you get past some very bad history? Uh, and then the other issue sort of, again, it may sound really childlike, but I, I kind of, as a viewer, 
uh, would want to see something about the great heritage of Armenia, the churches and whatnot. And I would like to see, I would like to learn more about the Azeri culture because I think probably a lot of Americans don't understand what that is all about. So I just think that there are some bigger issues outside of the basic Minsk yes or Minsk no and um, some of the other, I mean, of course, the issue of foreign fighters. I mean, there's so much on the geopolitical uh, front to attack and to discuss, but I think some of these other issues might help bring in uh, some viewers, some editors, some journalists. I throw it out there. Amy, thank you so much. I mean, I always know when someone starts with saying that I may pass naive question or something, I know that I have to think hard because it's always more, more serious points that uh, it's coming from the people. I'm always, always afraid when people are coming to my country and telling them how good experts are there my, about my country and explaining me everything that is happening in here. So when someone comes with a naive question, I know that I'm talking to real experts. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Boris, so you have to prepare yourself for the next intervention after we hear Ambassador Robert, because I mean, this question that Amy was passing on, I think some of them are, there is no better expert than you, not only in this panel, but if whatever, however we square the panel, I mean, you would be the one that is uh, that could be answered to a lot of these topics. So Ambassador Chakuta, Robert, can you take the floor? And uh, I'm sure that Boris is going to take the floor after you, or take the screen, I'm sorry. Thank you, and I'm also going to run against the clock to try to get a couple of points across uh, that Amy raised. Yes, there are people who could be doing this. And yes, this is something which I think we need to be trying to do in terms of uh, mediation and uh, strong engagement, whether you do it in terms of a Holbrook, um, with whom I work both in Afghanistan and in, in the Balkans, uh, or someone else. There are other people out there who could be doing this. And I think, but the question is they need to be empowered and they need to be seen as ha someone having their back. Um, I think we come back again at this geopolitical question. One thing that actually crossed my mind, um, you know, we talked about the, power, the energy system. Russia has really not wanted to see the Southern Gas Corridor built, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline built. Um, if it got disrupted, um, whatever the Russian equivalent of Schadenfreude uh, would, would apply in Moscow. Gee, isn't that just too bad? We can just keep sending more gas, more oil, particularly gas into, into Europe, and continue to use that as a tool to blackmail European governments. Um, the cultural question is important. And yes, this is one of the things actually going into the disclosure system. My son's a photographer, and he's been publishing a whole bunch of pictures lately of his, what he took in, in Azerbaijan and sort of trying to sort of you know, help raise some awareness among Americans. But I want to come back to something else here, and that is there are Americans who are interested, and Susan sort of backed into that a bit. The Armenian American groups are strongly interested. Um, it was interesting, I saw an article in the, in the Boston Globe recently. Um, guess what? There's a large Armenian American community in Boston. Um, Representative Schiff in California, Pallone, others in uh, Southern California are active on this question. Guess what? large American, uh, 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 Armenian American population in Southern California, Kim Kardashian, among others, sort of raising this question, raising it directly, I think, with the White House. Um, so yes, there are people who are interested. They're on one side, I think, in this. The Azerbaijani American community is very, very small, some in Southern California, some in Houston, uh, New York. Um, but th this, this question, I think, keeps coming back to the geopolitics, unfortunately. And one of the hard things in foreign policy is how geopolitics actually affects people individually. And, you know, and we have, I think, remembering the, the Balkan conflicts, you know, seeing the, the horrors of what was happening in a, in a country that many Americans knew uh, was shocking and helped drive some of that, U, that U.S. pressure at the time. Uh, we're not seeing that quite so much now. But I think, again, um, the, these questions of what is in America's interest are paramount. And what is in America's interest, I would argue, is maintaining the independence, integrity of countries, um, which is what we you know, were so concerned about in the, in the Cold War. And you know, looking you know, you know, a Poland that was able to be Poland, that was one of the things we talked about during the Reagan period. Um, these, you know, what we're seeing now is Russia using this conflict to advance its own interests. Um, and 
going to be seeing, you know, whether it's the good fairy that comes in and, and brings, you know, peace to the region, which I doubt, or just keeps it going. It's going to be using it in their interest, and that's going to cost the United States. Um, and then again, you know, the potential for others. Iran is very good at mucking around in different things and seizing opportunities, something else which I think we need to be thinking about. Um, but again, I think, you know, coming back to this point of, you know, how do we move forward? It is going to depend on the election. I'm not sure I'm going to stay out of, I have my own political views. I'm going to leave them out of here right now. But, you know, in a second Trump administration, are we going to continue to sort of see the situation where countries are sort of left to their own devices, which then can have consequences, negative consequences, I would argue in this case for the United States. Or are we going to see a Biden administration, which goes back to more the, the, the focus on the international rules-based system and maintaining that and seeing that international rules-based system as an American's interest. Uh, the timing, um, if it's COVID, if it's the US election, um, these are factors that I think are probably playing into what's going on right now in the region. And frankly, in our inability to sort of move forward. I hope, you know, I would like to see a strong statement today out of, out of, out of foggy bottom. I'm not optimistic. But um, I think, you know, this is something which is gonna continue and do we just let a conflict in Europe keeps you know going, killing people. Um, that's going to burn the United States. Thank you, uh, Boris. I hope you will give some food for thoughts for Amy. I mean, in his and her her questions or very serious points that she made, because in these parts of the world, it's much more about uh, culture, history, and tradition, and things that are. Uh, rooted deeply, or at least that after a while they get pulled out in order to be the reason how people can be uh, grouped and then later on, on the end, manipulated over the real substantial issue. But Boris, please. Thank you, Zatko. Uh, first of all, uh, someone has mentioned that uh, we have to have a, a specific and the right person to be interlocutor in that conflict. Uh, which means that person has to be uh, well accepted by both sides, not uh, uh, treated as a kind of uh, enemy or someone who was involved in the conflict in a not proper way in the past. Uh, but also the person who has to understand uh, specific differences between cultures and uh, historical uh, uh, disputes that we have in the uh, South Caucasus and to understand the wider perspective, not only South Caucasus, but Northern Caucasus and uh, Caspian, uh, Black Sea and the Turkish involvement. I said that we have uh, two uh, significant powers that are involved in that conflict. This is Russia and Turkey. And in the final stage, they have to find solution and they have to be involved in solving that conflict. This is how I consider uh, that situation right now. But I have to mention something that Turkey and Russia in the recent period of the history uh, has been involved in a conflict in Syria. They were very, very close to military conflict in the, in the, in the, in the longer term. Uh, but hopefully they were finding solution uh, in the meetings with between Erdogan and uh, and uh, uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, uh, after that they they were involved somehow in the conflict in Libya. They are supporting different sides in Libya, and now they they are involved in the conflict in Nagorno Karabakh, uh, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, this is extremely sensitive situation. Extremely sensitive. I mean, this is not only about. Russia and uh, Turkey. This is not only about CSTO and the NATO. Russia is a member of CSTO. Turkey is a significant member of the NATO. But this is also, uh, in terms of, this is also connected with uh, with uh, some other organizations and uh, and uh, not multilateral but specific organizations like Muslim Brothers and other organizations uh, because uh, the, those leaders are also connected with uh, such organizations. And uh, we have to take this into the account. Uh, in, in that direction, that conflict can trigger wider conflicts and many, many different conflicts, conflicts all around the world. 
and I am, am also taking this into the account very serious. But now we are coming to the issue of uh, uh, facilitator or in, in, interlocutor who can be extremely helpful uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next few weeks, I hope, uh, not months, uh, if uh, we are going to have a ceasefire uh, somehow and the big powers that uh, can trigger such a positive scenario. Uh, this is really very important, to have someone, some person, who understands specific cultures of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, some, someone have said that uh, in the uh, United States, Armenian ethnic group is considering Nagorno-Karabakh as a historical part of uh, Armenia. Uh, this is exactly what ordinary Serbs are thinking about Kosovo. But in that direction, uh, also people like uh, Dick Holbrook, who was involved in a conflict of, on Kosovo, uh, I mean, that type of uh, negotiator or facilitator is not very helpful if uh, you are taking into account my opinion. Uh, Dick Holbrook's strategy was that one side has to get everything and the other side, I mean, Serbia has to lose everything. And finally, he was punishing not only not the Milosevic regime, but he was punishing democratic system in Serbia uh, by putting on the shoulder of responsibility about Kosovo all democratic forces in my country. In that dimension and direction, we have to, to be very careful in terms of finding right persons or organizations who, who can be a real interlocutor in this conflict. That person has to respect different cultures, to understand uh, the, the conflict in the wider perspective, in historical context, and to understand, uh, uh, I mean, contribution of that cultures and that political system to the political situation and the, and the, and the history of the, of the region of South, South Caucasus. I'm, I'm looking to the map and I see how com complicated is the situation there and uh, how all those issues, culture, uh, geostrategical position, two uh, main uh, area of the of the energy like caspian area and the black sea area and the transportation and uh, the facilities and the new resources of gas and oil and all those issues are uh, very sensitive in this area and uh, everything is going to have impact on final solution of this conflict this is how i consider that situation so Marian, thank you boris Marian, can you just catch up on this uh, that uh, Boris was saying and maybe to also do some thoughts about Amy's question uh, concerning about the, the complexity of uh, history and uh, things that are people are connected with from religious perspective, ethnic perspective or anything else that is behind uh, you know bread and butter things. Demute, Melanie. Good. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes, perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the problems uh, around the world are more or less the same. Typically, it's always the question, as I said, uh, the minority rights versus the sovereignty of the state. And if you include in that religious differences, you have very complex situations. This is the situation in Kosovo, this was the situation in Bosnia, this is the situation now in Nagorno-Karabakh, it's in some other parts of the world also. And this is always a very complex uh, situation and it's not so easy to find the, the solutions which are acceptable for the whole sides. And I completely agree with those uh, participants who said that it's needed to have the serious negotiator now involved in the conflict. Is it within the Minsk group? I don't know. Maybe it's the only group which is realistic. Let's do it there. But it has to be someone who is not typical bureaucrat, who is enthusiastic enough, who will uh, travel all over the region, who will meet with the players, who will be patient, who will be supported. Uh, without that, there is no way to find uh, a tool to put the 
uh, let's say all sides involved at the same at the same table. I think that the personal influence of negotiator is also very much important, but the basic precondition for that is agreement, some sort of the agreement among at least Minsk member countries, Minsk group member countries. They have to agree and they have to say, let's work, let's try, and let's appoint someone who will uh, be supported by all of us. Without that, uh, to expect something which will happen by itself, it's very unrealistic and very naive. Unfortunately, without this common approach, I don't see the way how to come to the situation. Second point is that basically local players, let's say um, Azerbaijan and Armenia, they have to know that it's very difficult to expect so-called to expect clear solution. That means extreme solution. Solution where one side will be completely happy and another side will be completely unhappy. This is not the solution then. Uh, then the side which will be un completely unhappy will wait for the second half of the game. We'll try to be in a better position. So solution must be somewhere in between. Uh, it's, I'm not very clever by saying so. But this is simply the only way and I think that even the, the example of Bosnia shows that very clearly no, none of the sides was completely happy but it, it, exactly because of that I think Dayton is somehow working not perfectly not it's not the most ideal society around the world but at least it stopped, it stopped the, the, the war the killings and gave some sort of the framework uh, for the country to continue to develop so the, the the reality that the solution will be somewhere in between has to be seen like uh, and has to be accepted even locally through the media through the political players through the different part of the societies through the universities uh, all of them have to understand that that this is that basically that will be at the end some of so in my opinion uh, if we all make a public pressure if we all make a public pressure on media on the big players maybe there is a chance to succeed in that without that i i'm very very pessimistic and i don't see how that can how this conflict will be solved what is the essence of the solution who will do it uh, what are the tools which will be used uh, is it will it be imposed by a single big player i am very very doubtable about that i think that there is a need to have a common approach a single strong negotiator very clear vision that solution is somewhere in between not extreme and if this is all accepted then we can be open without that i really believe that we can count on years in which conflict will continue uh, because uh, both sides have some sort of supporters so those who support one or another side will not allow that side to lose will give them additional weapon additional money additional resources additional war will continue then and this is the never-ending story hope that everybody will understand that relatively soon and that because of that this war will not continue and that there will be some sort of the acceptable solution for all, all sides. Alex, thank you, Madden. Alex, I would ask you, I mean, Madden, uh, Boris and me, are we are the guinea pigs who survived the experiment in the national community being present in our part of the world, but you are someone who actually is a role model of success. How you can be in between big powers and bring your country to some kind of transformation. And of course, you are the person who knows so much about this region. Oh. Yes, I mean, I really am very eager to hear your opinion after this. Well, thank you. I think that we, we have not enough time to explain, you know, this um, success story, what was not easy, but, but it happened. But if I, I want to say two things. The first, I, I fully agree with, with um, the last um, voices of, of uh, uh, Stefan, of, of Boris and, and Mladen and others. 
uh, we have two levels. The first level is the political, what we can do to find a solution, at least to stop um, uh, violence, to, to organize ceasefire. And, and that is a good question. I fully agree with uh, Boris who uh, described this person who should be a uh, negotiator in this uh, conflict. Yeah, that is a great idea, but I have uh, only one question. If uh, this person has been born or we have to wait when he or she will born. So, uh, in my opinion, th th that is uh, the problem. We have a lack of such personalities, of such um, people who could be a good negotiator, understanding both sides, understanding history, understanding the, the differences, religious, etc. So we have to use all these instruments, what we have, and I think uh, this return to Minsk um, um, is, is maybe not the best idea, but, but existing idea. That is something what is necessary to start again and to show that, that these international interests exist and we, we want to, to, to first, we, we watch the situation, we are, we are waiting, we are working for, for ceasefire and we try to, to find the, uh, the solution. Uh, speaking about uh, big players, um, uh, two players are quite predictable because I have no doubt that the main goal of Putin, or especially, uh, especially Putin, but Russia, uh, historically speaking, is to keep Caucasus, all Caucasus Republic, in the zone of Russian influence. I have no doubt. And that is the reason why Putin speaks about two brothers, Armenia and Azerbaijan, because he wants to keep these two republics in their own zone of, of influence. He is not ready to say, okay, I will be on the one side and I'm ready to resign on the other side. The same politics of Putin we can observe in, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Moldova, everywhere, uh, probably not so much in Baltic states, but other post-Soviet republics are absolutely under such Putin's pressure to stay as a, as a, as a, as a part of um, uh, Russian zone of, of influence. And in this sense, of course, Putin is quite uh, okay with, with frozen conflicts. He, 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 the stabilization of these countries, Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus today, and, and Caucasus, that is something what is working in favor of his strategy as far as he cannot uh, fulfill entire strategy, means to have all these countries again in some structures of this new great Russia or something, something like that. Turkey has owned quite predictable interests as well. We can describe this interest. And I think the main problem is the weakness today of the other big players, especially United States and European Union. About European Union, I cannot expect something extra during coming months, but I want to underline the importance of American election. Because I have to say very honestly that America with second term of Donald Trump will be not ready to solve the problems, but will create the problems, will create new problems. Because this idea of Trump, America first, and to destroy all these multi, uh, multilateral relationships, uh, organizations like uh, WHO or United Nations or NATO even, that is extremely dangerous for, for, for the future. And if we have a, for next four years, more or less, even more moderate, but such direction of the politics, I cannot uh, imagine such good solution for, for, for all conflicts, including Nagorno-Karabakh. I hope that if Joe Biden will be elected, we will have much more competent team in, in White House and surrounding the president. And then if Nagorno-Karabakh will be on the top, or maybe not the, the, on the number one, but on the, among the main uh, problems uh, to solve um, by new uh, Biden's ad administration, I can see some chance because then, you know, first of all, the result of Biden election will be improving of improvement of uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, relationships. It means that cooperation between European Union and America will be much better. And then to include some European voice in this uh, Nagorno-Karabakh solution uh, will be much, um, much easier and much more uh, uh, possible. So this election really is crucial for, for the future, for the world, for, for America, and for Nagorno-Karabakh as well. And that is what I want to underline because that is close, 4th of November, we'll see in what kind of world we will live longer. If it will be second uh, term of, of Donald Trump, I'm very much afraid. If we have a Joe Biden, I see some real chances, not only because Biden, but also because the people which can come with very competent, 
uh, very, let's say, predictable and responsible politics um, into the Department of State um, and, and, and White House. And this is this first political level which, which I want to, to, to describe. The second, what was a question about this reconciliation, I think this is absolutely uh, one of the most um, uh, things, uh, the most important things. Uh, I was very much involved in Polish-German reconciliation, Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation, Polish-Jewish reconciliation. And I tell you, that is something what would be great to, uh, to have in these two countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan. But reconciliation is absolutely the task for these two nations, for these two states. We can support by, by some grants, some money, etc., this reconciliation process, but we need the leaders of reconciliation process in these two countries. The leaders from the politics, from the intellectual uh, groups, uh, from, from the churches, from the various confessions, uh, journalists, etc. Because reconciliation is a very difficult, very sensitive and, and very long process. But it's necessary to have efforts every day to, to discuss, to, to speak, to uh, uh, try to, to organize this dialogue on, ver on various levels between young people, students, uh, uh, academics, etc., etc. If in these two countries, Azerbaijan and Armenia, and maybe our center, the Justice Center, can play some, some role in, in this um, uh, area, would be great. Because even if we will find one day what uh, seems today not very realistic, we will find some solution for the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, the problem with reconciliation between all these people will be very, very tough um, still. We'll have a problem how to overcome all these stereotypes, all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, bad time, bad thinking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And 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 I think if we can, uh, as NGOs uh, or uh, such uh, former politicians, um, uh, can help this process of reconciliation between Armenians and uh, others, uh, would be great. And I, I I'm ready personally also to support this these ideas fully because we need, we need th this activity, but the source of this reconciliation cannot be abroad. And of course, I don't speak about immigration, but I speak about these two countries and these two nations, because if you want to make this reconciliation, is not, we discuss, uh, Zlatko, do you remember such very nice, very good discussion in Sarajevo, what you organized some years ago. So it, 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 th that is absolutely the most sensitive, but the most um, promising, element of, of the future, the good, good process of reconciliation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alex. As I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure we, this is, uh, you know, uh, this debate, unfortunately, is uh, getting bigger and bigger, and uh, we are breaking all the erosion. This is additional reason why we have to continue with this. And as Susan and you were also very active, we were discussing about serious uh, topics like this and then GNGIC uh, can be used as a platform to have a more bigger involvement in understanding for what is going on. And of course, uh, NCAFP role in this context and your person is very important to us, especially for us who are, who are related with NGIC, members of NGIC. Uh, NGIC is becoming a bigger family and we have a lot of people who have a lot of things to say and who can contribute the discussions about this, especially about creating awareness of what is happening yeah. and understanding. And I think our, our overall discussion is showing how big this issue is, much bigger than the issue of only Nagorno-Karabakh and, 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 uh, and uh, Azerbaijan only. And unfortunately, this is something, and since Boris was in uh, London, we're mentioning the experience with, and a lot of you were calling for for having some mediator. I, I was the guilty one for mentioning Holbrook first. I mean, but Holbrook, when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is a little bit different than what happened, what Boris was referring to the issue of Kosovo, because Emada knows that very well, uh, that Holbrook came here in the circumstances that uh, were defined by a few factors. First, everyone wanted uh, to finally end the war because major players on the ground were so weak after so many, and they couldn't stand it. One thing is uh, that, that America took a leadership. After all this uh, international mediation and the UN umbrella and everything, but in the end, the US took a lead 
and had a Hobart who was there ready to stop in with, uh, with really, and the third element, which I think we as NGIC uh, can, uh, can contribute is uh, because the global awareness of the necessity to sort out the problem was created. Global necessity, and in the European Union, in, uh, in, even in Russia, they were interested in finally to sort out that, because that was different Russia than today's one, but in the United States, there was awareness that that has to be sorted out. So I think that uh, we should uh, we should keep in mind that uh, we as NGIC have to to be open platform and keep being open platform for putting a lot of different different voices, but see what we can do, how we can contribute, especially when it comes to uh, to, to to basically speaking, be someone who is guarding the principle of international law. After all, with all potential views from different sides. Uh, we have to see how we can come to some kind of political solution, how we can contribute that political solution. I'm warning that there is without political solution that is uh, dealing with uh, not the territory, not the square kilometers. The point is what I'm trying to say is that international law said that Azerbaijan is one country whose full territorial integrity is guaranteed by international law. And if we go in any portion of our history, we'll find different maps, which are maps that were maps of that time. But in a, in a period that is in front of us, more we go into the maps, more we are going back in, a, in unfinished wars. And then we are opening the, 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 not the battles for the future, but battles for the wars that were already lost and repeating them again and again. In that context, discussion about reconciliation, about the content of the territory, about the, of course, Armenian people have to have full right to live in one country, which is Azerbaijan with the full respect of their ethnic uh, rights, religious rights and everything that goes with it. That's maybe the lessons that we have from, from, from Dayton. I'm not saying from, because some other lessons may be draw wrong one lessons. So we are not excellent example of the sorted out the problems, but we are better <laughs> peace stopping the war uh, result then in a lot of other parts the international community was present. So in that sense, I would, I, I really think that Roshan, uh, I'm, I'm expecting from you and we are all expecting from you, I mean, to, to see that we use NGIC as a platform that will be putting together uh, voices of support for this type of political solution that respect international law and looking for the content of the territory, which is state of Azerbaijan that is not proxy state to anyone, but that is really state that has full autonomy. And one of the reasons, I mean, how we can move international community, especially Western Alliance, is to show that this is about, not Azerbaijan, but this is about the geostrategic politics that may go in wrong direction if we keep uh, uh, illusion that can be, this can be kept as a frozen conflict. Roshan, you wanted to say something, I'm sure, and please. A uh, couple of words, uh, and I think uh, the point uh, and the focus, what we have to do is not to look to the Eastern countries because they are not going to play any role, like, you know, including China or like, you know, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and so on. But uh, the most important thing is that how we can mobilize Western countries to be a more active role. And as you said uh, before, uh, the biggest concern is what is going to happen during the election week because uh, we we saw like you know this kind of uh, actions like you know so many times happening when everything is everyone is busy with something like you know huge events uh, someone is going attacking and someone is like you know doing something wrong and how we are going to to stop it and how we can play an active role does anyone want to have uh, Susan, please? I would just say uh, maybe I'll use a different example of a, a peacemaker from the US and that would be George Mitchell. Um, you know, my organization has been involved in, we were involved in the Irish peace process uh, as well as we've been involved in uh, discussions now with China, Taiwan and others. But um, when I think about, because I was US Consul General in Belfast, Northern Ireland and the, um, the kinds of things, and, and again, I, uh, you can like or not like Holbrook, I just meant, as I would say with, um, with uh, Zlatko, you know, 
a process. And I think the process, the thing that we need is the process of George Mitchell didn't just have the support of, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, but he had the support of both the Irish and the, uh, the UK prime ministers to bring the parties together and work things out. So, um, but it, it has to be someone, I mean, we can start and maybe one thing that this group needs to do also is to begin to solidify our discussions into some policy recommendations that we could make in, not just that we make to US government, but that we make to, um, to all countries uh, involved, all of you, you know, if we want to get Europeans involved, um, because that's uh, one thing that we do, again, in my organization, we have a lot of private uh, track two discussions and we don't attribute anything to anyone, but we write a report and we come up with some recommendations and then we go and all brief uh, our respective governments. And as well, we brief, like here in New York, I brief the representatives of the governments of the countries I'm involved in. So I may talk to the Chinese consul general. I may talk to the, you know, the Japanese consul general, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be one thing that I think we could do because I've heard a lot of good ideas today. I want to thank everybody for it, but maybe, as we continue, and I can work with Latko and Rafshan on this, um, to maybe begin to solidify some recommendations that we could begin uh, to put, uh, you know, to put to put forward. I mean, even Zlatko in the, you know, in our discussion about the Western Balkans, we we wrote a report, and you know, I would hope as we do these, we can come up with some constructive ideas that perhaps then we can recommend to the decision makers. I don't know if that's, I know it's, uh, it's, and maybe it comes out, we could see how it comes out because, you know, who is making the recommendations? And because, you know, NGIC is located in Baku, maybe it needs to be, we're seen to be, you know, a, a party of interested uh, people who want to see a resolution to the conflict. Um, but anyway, I just leave that as something to think about as we move forward. Well, Susan, I want to, I, I can't thank you more. Uh, Roshan, I would ask you to take the floor before just to, can we have, a, have a David, just a brief comment, because I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm so enlightened in these two hours. And I mean, I can sure that we can go for long. And I have some of you who are testing me that uh, you would like to stay more, but I mean, time is really leaking out. David, would you please? And Roshan, uh, I'm sure that what uh, Susan proposed is more than uh, reasonable that we agree that we should take care of it, Susan, yourself, me, and uh, include everyone else to do maybe make something which looks like a policy recommendation or something like it, and maybe put it again as a, as a, as a paper for discussion for some round like this in the near future. But if that is okay, Roshan, before before you take the screen, please, David, would you? Would you no. uh, David, we can't hear you. Uh, David, I mean, demute, demute yourself. David. Roshan, can you demute to David? Uh. Yeah, could. David, I hope you will be able to, because you are still muted. And unfortunately we can't hear you for, I know we. Uh, All right, yeah. sorry about that. Excellent, thank you, thank you, David. Please. All right, my apologies. Uh, I will be brief. Um, I, I'd like to obviously end where I started, which is uh, condolences on the loss of life and the importance of, uh, of reaching a, a ceasefire. And, and uh, I thought it was a very important uh, point uh, that was made from our colleague from Baku that, that uh, the, uh, the return of the adjacent uh, territories uh, pushing off the final status of Nagorno-Karabakh and having a, um, a corridor uh, in the past uh, was agreed by the parties and, and hopefully that will be uh, returned again. Um, I, I think a negotiator uh, does exist. Uh, I think that the, the type of, of person that uh, President Krzyzewski 
uh, described does exist. And, and I think uh, two things that a, a new President Biden could do would be very positive from a, from a U.S. perspective. Um, one would be to appoint uh, Ambassador Bill Burns uh, as, as a negotiator. Uh, Bill was uh, ambassador in Moscow, is well known, and he knows the Russians and what regarded there. Uh, he was ambassador in Jordan and deputy secretary of, of state, uh, and the Turks know him well. The, the, he, he's very, very familiar uh, with uh, the parties in the conflict and the, and the, the intricacies uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, and he's well regarded in Washington um, and in Brussels and in Paris and in, and in Moscow, as well as Ankara, uh, Baku, and, and Yerevan. Uh, second, uh, I think that the uh, President Kuznetsky, again, who has more experience than any of us, uh, really put the, together the challenges uh, of um, uh, uniting a, a population. Way back during the Clinton administration, uh, me and colleagues on, on the, in the House uh, put together an incentive package uh, for um, peace in the caucuses. And it, and it involved infrastructure projects that would make sure that the, the infrastructure uh, linked all of the regions. So that meant that it was linked back towards Azerbaijan as well as Erevan. Erevan. Uh, so you, you did not preclude the, the direction. You know, right now, the money that goes into to, um, the uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh is only pointed towards uh, Armenia. And, and there's, there's steps that need to be done in the reconstruction and, and really having these people see that there is a, a brighter future uh, in a more integrated uh, South Caucasus. Uh, thank you, David. I think, uh, I mean, if, if uh, Bill Burns is uh, in the loop, I mean, for something like that, this, this is very encouraging encouraging news about the capacity of the person and about the profile and uh, everything that goes with uh, with Bern Burns, who we all know from different different some of you much better i mean but this is definitely good news. it's 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 an uh, I, it's an idea he is not in any way committed to it but i think it'd be i like ideas when they're small i like ideas when they're small when they start floating that's the way to become big so i mean that's a good way of thinking, let me put it this way. But that's a good way of thinking. I mean, that uh, if we have a new new administration, that would uh, have someone who would be really having uh, substantially that administration for. And this is the part of the world, and especially Nagorno-Karabakh, requires uh, on the overall circumstance, we're talking about someone who would be more involved in it. But uh, Roshan, if you, if, we, if you don't mind, I would really uh, thank you, and I think that we agreed what Susan was offering as a, as a, as a goodwill ambassador and uh, ambassador who is uh, running an uh, uh, organization that we all are kind of family to, uh, NCAP. So I think that would be great, I mean, to, to do follow up uh, the things and consolidate maybe somehow some of the things that we discussed not only today but previously and see that maybe we can produce something which would be paper for further discussion. The next time we discuss about very concrete things, so I'm really ready, I'm sure that all of us are ready to participate in it. So, yeah, and we can, uh, we can discuss this uh, afterward because I yeah, think I found, uh, you know, especially in the virtual world, to kind of have a paper and have a starting point, then we all can kind of react to a position and, you know, it helps us to focus our dialogue on getting to some kind of concrete, um, suggestions, recommendations, solutions. And I actually need to go because I have a meeting at 1210, but um, um, thank you again. Thank you, Ravshan and Zlatko, and thanks everyone for participating. This has been very helpful, especially thank you, Amy, too, as well. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I hope we didn't thank confuse you. you more. I hope we didn't confuse you more. And uh, I hope that we didn't open new questions without uh, getting any hints about what you were interested in. No, but it's I'm been in... great, and I have to go too, so I thank you all. Thank you. So I want to thank you all, I mean, to all of you from different parts of the world, uh, and uh, Madden and Alex and Boris, and, and of course, Robert and Amy to you and David and Susan. So Roshan, as, a, as a, our, our, our Spielberg, who is behind this, this production, I want to thanks to Roshan Murada, our Steven Spielberg. Uh, in his role in his uh, capacity and that ocean will be back and 
Nizami Ganjave is really, as an NGIC, is really going to continue with this being a platform for more, what is our mission? For more dialogue, for more dialogue with tolerance and respect, and for learning, and then we will understand much more each other and the world around us and be ready to participate in this process of our transformation to better. So thank you so much, it really, uh, I mean, I'm so, I, I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Amy, thank I learned you. a lot, even from your naive questions. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank bye you. bye.